start off by asking uh, both of them some questions. And if it stimulates your thinking and you'd like to ask a question as well, we would ask you to put it on one of the papers that's on the table, and then we'll collect them and, and, and sort of feed them in. But if, Joe, if I could, I'd like to start with you. You're Mr. Soft Power, if you would. Uh, as I think many of you know, uh, Joe and I coined the phrase soft power, talking about the strength of the country's ideals and culture and values. Uh, how is our soft power getting today? And how does soft power relate to uh, greatness of America? Well, it's, a, it's interesting when people talk about power, they sometimes oversimplify it. Uh, power is the ability to get others to do what you want. And you can do it three ways. You can do it either by coercion, you can do it by payment, or you can do it by attraction. And if you can attract people to do what you want, you can save a lot on carrots and sticks. Now, this doesn't mean I don't want a lot of hard power. In fact, I want to invest in Harry Harris. But uh, I also was an assistant secretary of the Defense Department. So I believe deeply that hard power matters. But if your hard power is combined with attractiveness, you can economize on the carrots and sticks and you get a little further. And in the long run, it also can make a difference in how history turns out. If you look at the Berlin Wall going down in 1989, it didn't go down under Howard's it went down under bulldozers, wielded by people whose minds had been changed by ideas that had crossed the Iron Curtain. So in that sense, we have to be concerned with our soft power. In fact, General Battis, uh, who's no softy, uh, said a week or two ago, quoted the saying, if we don't invest in the State Department, I have to buy more bombs and bullets. And Bob Gates, who is also no salty, went to Kansas in, 19, in 2007 when he was working for George W. Bush and said, I'm here to plead for more money for the State Department. You might think that sounds like a news story that reads, Man Bites Dog. But in fact, that's what we need. And what are we finding today? We're finding that the president plans to cut the budget of the State Department 28%, getting rid of programs like Fulbright or aid programs. And he's also in favor of increasing the defense budget. I favor increasing the defense budget, but I don't favor increasing or decreases the budget of the State Department. So if you ask, how do we do guns and butters? The answer is it's not guns versus butter. It's guns versus butter versus taxes. We could afford to pay more to have both State Department and Defense Department. And the idea that we're not doing all of that is a failure of leadership. So if you ask me to predict Will American soft power be stronger a year from now? I fear it's going to be weaker. Thank you, gentlemen. Harry, uh, you're no softy, but I, I do know in reality that many of the programs that the Pacific Command does does build on soft power. Uh, the security assistance, the patient uh, building efforts. But primarily, as, as Joe says, uh, we look to the Pacific Command for hard power. So how are we doing? Uh, how are the forces doing? Do you feel you have the, the forces that you need to meet the challenges that you face today? Uh, thanks for that great question, Ralph. Let me, let me just start off by uh, uh, giving you some full disclosure. So I learned at the foot of the master, and the master is sitting between uh, Ralph and me, because I was uh, Dr. Nye's student uh, at Harvard. So I feel a little bit intimidated right now because I know that whatever I say, he's going to slip me a grade uh, after, after I'm 
I've done it. I'll do the best I can. So uh, I believe that PICOM epitomizes hard power. And the challenges that we face in the Pacific require both hard and soft power solutions. But I'm going to provide that hard power uh, uh, piece in order to meet the challenges that we face from North Korea, uh, from China, uh, from Russia, at least the Pacific part of Russia, uh, and ISIS uh, that's prevalent uh, and growing uh, in the Pacific. But I do believe uh, that the solution set for the problems we face are a combination of both soft and hard power. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a fan of a French guy named Talleyrand. You know, the way I talk, it sounds like his first name is Tally and his last name is Rand. But it's really one word, it's, it's uh, Talleyrand. And when Talleyrand was the Minister of Foreign Affairs for France, uh, he was talking to his Chief of Defense. And his Chief of Defense was a fellow named Folk, Marshal Folk. And Talleyrand said to Folk, he said, hey Marshal, you know, when my profession fails, that's Talleyrand's profession, yours has to come to the rescue. And I believe that we're a much better country when Talleyrand's profession, the profession of diplomacy, and my profession, the profession of arms, work hand in hand so that one doesn't have to fail and one doesn't have to come to the rescue. Uh, and, and I'll just leave it at that and, and wait for the next, uh, next question. Hey. And he's a tough breaker too, so. So, that's good. Uh, let me follow up, Harry, if I can, because I've, I've just come back from a five-country trip in Asia, and uh, a lot of anxiety, uh, a lot of questions about has America's commitment weakened uh, in Asia. Uh, from your standpoint as, as an operational commander, uh, what's changed uh, with the new administration? Have you gotten new marching orders? Are you still doing essentially what, what we were doing? How do we reassure our yeah, and so uh, from my perspective uh, as a combatant commander in the Pacific, uh, you know, we, I just learned yesterday that the pivot is gone uh, and the rebalance is gone if you believe Susan, Susan Thornton uh, over at State. But I believe that, that those are just names. You know, you can change your name, but you can't change your stripes. And so the name that we call America's commitment to the Pacific in the last eight years started out as a pivot to the Pacific, and then it became the rebalance of the Pacific. But our commitment to the Pacific remained and remains as strong as ever. Uh, and so uh, uh, since the uh, election and since the inauguration, uh, I've traveled uh, around the, uh, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, and I am confronted with questions from my friends, allies, and partners, and I know I'm watched by our adversaries on just how serious is America's commitment to the region. And I believe that our commitment is as strong today as it ever has been, if not stronger. And you look at, you know, Secretary of Defense Mattis, his very first trip, the very first trip he made was to the region. Today, uh, Secretary of State Tillerson uh, is in the region. He's, he's visiting uh, uh, China and uh, Japan and Korea and other places. Uh, Vice President Pence is coming out to the region here soon. Uh, I'm headed to Nepal uh, this weekend. I, I, I was a keynote at the Rasina Dialogue in India. Uh, we've got uh, a bunch of interactions with Australia uh, on, the, on the near horizon. So these are uh, opportunities to reassure our friends, allies, and partners, and also to emphasize to our adversaries that America is committed to the Indo-Asian Pacific region uh, and always will be because I believe that undeniably America is a Pacific nation, uh, we're a Pacific power, and we're here in the Pacific. As said, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, there are certainly strong proponents in the Congress for both a strong defense budget and strong diplomacy. Do you think our system of checks and balances is gonna get us over some of the hysteria that we see right now? Well, I, I should start by saying I'm a great admirer of John McCain. This is a man who really represents integrity in American politics. And I think he rises above partisan differences. And I think he's exactly right about, uh, about what he has said on this and the lead he's 
taken. I was at the Munich Security Conference last month, which is not entirely Europe, more Europe than was there. Guang Yi was there for China and a few others. But McCain has led a delegation to Munich uh, for a dozen years or so. And that ability of having a major American senator head of the Armed Services Committee reassure allies that the United States is broadly going to support them is extremely important. And that's why I think the fact that Secretary Mattis has spoken well in the Pacific is important. But having to support people like John McCain and Lindsey Graham and others is equally important. The Senate is there as well. So I, I agree uh, very much with, with what Harry said about the, it's not the words pivot or rebalancing. It's a question of can we manage the rise of China in a region by maintaining an alliance system where we have a strong hand because of our allies. And I think we can. And I think that's going to be crucial to success. Now, the question of do you do it through TACOM? Absolutely. But even TACOM has aspects of it which are very much related to soft power. If you go back to uh, the Indonesian tsunami in 2003 4, the American relief for Aceh in northern Indonesia enormously restored faith in the United States after it had been knocked down by the invasion of Iraq. Or if you go to the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, bringing people together, creating networks, as the Pacific Forum does, that's also part of it. So a smart power strategy has to combine the commitment to our alliance absolutely firm about that, but also we need a web of personal relationships so that people want us, not because we force ourselves upon them, but because we're there as people want us. And that's a huge asset that we have. Ask yourself, how many allies does the United States have in the Pacific? In the world, in the world, about 60. How many does China have? North Korea, Pakistan, anymore? Uh, this is a huge asset. And that small power comes partly from our ability to protect, but partly because our power attracts. So in that sense, I think the, the key for our future is to figure out how to combine our hard and soft power resources at the same time. And I think we can do it. We've done it in the past. But I worry that if we go through this kind of wholesale cuts, 28% in the State Department that was announced today, uh, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Joe, so thank you. Uh, let me do a, a follow-up to there's been a lot of questions about is America willing to lead? Uh, I guess the reverse question is do, do people in Asia still want us to lead? What is the sense that you get, both of you, when, when traveling through the area as far as the receptiveness? And, and what is it that they're looking for from us? So, in, in all of uh, my travels in the region, uh, I, I feel this desire and pull for American leadership. People in the region, we want America's leadership uh, to be worn on our sleeves. Uh, they want it out in front, uh, and they want to know that America is going to be, is going to continue to lead in the Indo-Asian Pacific. I'll give you a great example. Uh, I was in a country recently, I don't want to name the country, uh, but I was in a country with a team uh, last November, uh, and we were talking about IMED. You know, IMED is an international military education and training this is where in the United States we fund uh, senior military officers uh, at the colonel, uh, captain, the navy captain, uh, army, air force, marine colonel, lieutenant colonel, commander level. And we
we send them to our war colleges uh, in the United States. Uh, and we send them here for a whole year, two years in some cases, uh, and their families come with them, and they live in uh, Washington, D.C. if they're going to go to the NDU, National Defense University, uh, or they go to uh, uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to the Army War College, or Newport, Rhode Island, to the uh, Naval War College, uh, or Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, to the Army Command General Staff Force, and on and on and on. So I was in this country recently, and we cut IMET from them, and IMET is a congressionally controlled program. We cut IMET from them a number of years ago because we were displeased with, with uh, some of the activities uh, that were uh, being done in that country. So uh, IMET is typically the first thing that goes when we want to express our displeasure with what, uh, what's going on in the country. I believe it should be the last thing that goes, not the first thing. But it is easy to cut. Uh, and sure enough, we cut it uh, in this particular country. And so this country sends its senior officers for senior war colleges, uh, it sends them to Pakistan and China. So this chief of defense said to me, he said to me, Admiral, would you rather my senior officers learn uh, about the relationship between the military uh, and civilian leadership from China or Pakistan, or would you rather us learn uh, on how a military fits uh, in a civilian control system in the United States? The choice is yours. And while he had me there, uh, because the choice is ours, and we've chosen instead to cut the IMAP program from this country, uh, and the result is uh, this country is sending their senior officers to Pakistan and China. And, and they're learning the role of the military in a, in a, in a, in a country from uh, a country, from countries who are not known for their human rights or not known for civil control of the military. So uh, I think that the region is crying out for American leadership uh, and we uh, failed to step into that breach at our peril. I, I agree completely with what Harry said. I met came under my uh, remit when I was Assistant Secretary for International Security Affairs, and I used to go up to the Hill and testify why we should keep I met and not cut it. And uh, anybody who thinks all our problems have started with Donald Trump should remember that Congress has been cutting I met for a long time. Uh, we have a problem which is trying to explain why it's worth spending money on bringing people together. And bringing people together doesn't solve all problems, but it sure is a good start. And uh, in that sense, I think uh, IMED is a great program, and frankly, for a much less amount of money, so is the Pacific Corps. But that's just a side word. But, but I think the, the point that you asked Ralph about, uh, is there a desire for American presence there clearly is. I mean, if we step back and look at what's happening in Asia, you have the rise of China, you have the rise of India, and countries benefit from having a strong American presence. It keeps their options open. It helps them preserve their freedom. So that in addition to our values, which are attractive in many countries, not all, but many, uh, elementary International Politics 101, based on the balance of power, says if you're a country in a region where there's a rising power, you sure ought to keep a close relationship with a distant benign power. And that's the strength of the United States position in East Asia. Good. Speaking of rising powers, uh, a simple or uh, a short question to both of you. China, friend or foe? Uh, there is a short question with a serious answer. So, uh, so I, I want China to be a friend, and I want to view China as a friend. But I believe in the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus. And so, uh, I'm a military officer, and all of you 
want me to look at the world through a realistic lens. So I, I talk about, uh, you know, I, I live in a world where the glass is always half empty. Uh, you know, and, and if you want somebody, if you want me to think about the world uh, through rose-colored glasses, then, you know, give uh, Ronald McDonald or Buzz or the clown or somebody to come up here and sit here. I have to look through the world darkly. Uh, and I view China as a threat to the United States because of, the, of their military buildup, what they're doing. And they haven't demonstrated to me uh, that they want to be a friend of the United States or a friend of the region for that matter. Uh, when you look at their buildup in the South China Sea, uh, when you look at what they're not doing with North Korea, uh, and you look at the, uh, the problems that they present to the region, uh, that, that, that I think that, uh, uh, that they're, 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 they're not a friend, uh, and uh, you know, I have to prepare for the worst case, and, and that's what I do uh, on a daily basis. You know, I was in uh, the region recently, and I told this story that I heard one time uh, about a woman uh, who wanted to have a pet python. And so she called up her veterinarian friend, uh, and, and this, this fellow got her a, a baby python. And so she loved this little snake. She fed it every day, and, and this snake sat next to her, and she was reading uh, at the end of the day, and then she'd take the snake to bed with her, and the snake would sit there, would uh, fall asleep next to her, all coiled up and all that. And the snake kept getting bigger and bigger, and she loved the snake more and more. But one day, she woke up in the middle of the night, and this snake was all stretched out flat, completely flat next to her. And she didn't know what to do, so she called up her veterinary friend. And the veterinary friend said, Lady, get out of the bed right now and get out of the house right now. And when she said, well, why? He said to her, because a snake is measuring you up. <laughs> uh, and so that's the, that's the danger of what's happening to China. When these countries move in, you know, China is measuring us up. And, and I think that for that reason, I view China uh, through a lens dark. I think the, uh, the key question for us is not whether China is friend or foe. It could become either. The question is, can we manage the rise of China? Thank you.